Hi, I'm Gordon from Camera Labs, and this is my review of the Sony ZV-E1, a full-frame mirrorless camera aimed at video creators. It packs the sensor and IBIS from the A7S Mark III into a smaller body with no viewfinder, but a bunch of features designed to make filming easier, especially if you're a team of one. Launched in March 2023 at around $2,200, the ZV-E1 becomes the fourth model in the ZV range and sports both the largest sensor and the highest price in the series to date. The original ZV-1 was essentially a reworked RX100 Mark V for vloggers, employing the same 1-inch type sensor and 24-70 zoom, but dropping the viewfinder and adding an improved microphone, as well as some helpful new filming modes. It's still available for around $750. The follow-up ZV-E10 essentially did the same trick with the A6400, inheriting its unstabilized APS-C sensor and the chance to swap lenses, but again dropping the viewfinder and gaining the improved microphone. It costs around $700 for the body alone, or around $800 with the 16-50 kit zoom. Sony then added a new version of the ZV-1 called the 1F, which swapped the zoom for a fixed 20mm equivalent prime, making it more suitable for handheld vlogging, but most of us could guess that a full-frame ZV model wouldn't be far behind. Enter the latest ZV-E1, which essentially takes the 12 megapixel sensor with IBIS from the A7S Mark III, and, following earlier models, drops the viewfinder and adds the improved microphone, plus some new AI-based vlog-friendly filming modes. In these respects, it could be seen as a simpler, more affordable version of the A7S III, or perhaps a consumer-focused FX3 that's optimized for vloggers, or size-wise, maybe a video-oriented version of the A7C. However you choose to describe it, the ZV-E1 is unashamedly aimed at videographers. Sure, it can still take photos, but this is not designed as a hybrid camera. If photos and video are equally important to you, you will be better served by the similarly priced A7 IV. Okay, let's get on with the review, starting with the design and controls. Here's the ZV-E1 on the left, alongside the A7 IV on the right, the latter also representing other models in the full-frame alpha range in terms of size. Most obviously, from the outside, the ZV-E1, like the FX3 and other ZV models, slices off the viewfinder head to become much shorter. In fact, it becomes one of the smallest and lightest full-frame cameras to date, at least those with IBIS and without viewfinders. As you look around the bodies, you'll notice the ZV-E1 has just one control dial, although, like Sony's other video-focused cameras, the shutter release includes a spring-loaded rocker for adjusting the zoom, be it digital, using clear image, or optical with a compatible power zoom lens. From the top, you'll also notice a simpler layout, lacking the mode dial of traditional cameras, and instead just relying on a simple switch to set it between photo, video, and the S and Q slow and quick modes. Also note the generously sized red record button, and one dedicated to background defocus to its right. To put the size into perspective again, here's the ZV-E1 on the left, but this time alongside the A6400 on the right, Coincidentally, the camera I use to film most of my videos, including this piece to camera. The ZV-E1 is a little larger in every dimension, but it's still striking how similar they are in size. Again, the main feature benefits of the A6400 here are its built-in viewfinder, not to mention a high-resolution sensor that's more aimed at hybrid use, but the ZV-E1 counters with a larger full-frame sensor, IBIS stabilization, a better built-in microphone, and all those new filming modes. Oh, and if you prefer, the ZV-E1 is also available in white, although I don't believe Sony goes as far as to offer a matching version of the 28-60 kit zoom. Like other ZV models to date, there's no viewfinder, leaving composition and playback entirely down to the 3-inch screen with 1.04 million dots. Again, like earlier models, it's side-hinged, allowing it to flip out to face you, twist up and down, or fold back on itself for protection. It is, of course, touch-sensitive, and Sony's introduced a new set of shortcut icons accessed by swiping left and right, or up and down. These provide quick access to many filming options, from the defocus level to the microphone direction, and they're handy on a body which has fewer physical controls. On the left side of the body are three flaps. Behind the top one are a 3.5mm microphone input and a USB-C port, the latter supporting charging, power delivery, and UVC UAC output for use as a standard USB webcam, and in a nice upgrade, it'll even now stream over USB in 4K up to 30p. The larger flap in the middle opens to reveal a single SD card slot, so sadly no dual slots for backup, nor support for faster CF Express Type A cards. 
which in turn limits the maximum video bit rates to 600 megabits per second. I realise earlier ZV cameras also only had one SD slot and understand there's always losses when making bodies smaller, but for a camera at this price aimed at higher end videographers, well, the inability to back up to a second card will be a reason that some of them will choose the a7 IV or spend more on the a7S III instead. Meanwhile, behind the third port at the bottom are a micro HDMI port and a 3.5mm headphone jack. Yep, I'm afraid that's right, the cursed micro HDMI port rather than the more robust full-size ports of the a7 IV and S3, and the ZV E1 also lacks the raw video output of the S3. Now at this point, you might be getting a little concerned that the ZV E1 has also compromised battery life, but I'm pleased to report that it still takes the same FZ100 pack as the larger models in the range. Sony quotes 95 minutes of video recording on a full charge, but it really does depend on the video quality and the potential for the camera to overheat. Like other recent Sony cameras, you can set the auto power off temp setting to high and allow the body to become very warm to extend recording times. With this setting enabled, I managed to record 52 minutes and 25 seconds of 4K 50p, and that was in XAVC HS video, before the camera became very warm and shut itself down, albeit with roughly two thirds of the battery remaining. The larger bodies and heat sinks of the other models in the Alpha range though should allow longer recording times, even effectively unlimited in some conditions. Switching to 1080 50p footage, I managed just over two hours and 20 minutes on a single charge on the ZV E1. And you can see that clip still running just overlaid above my head right now. And in the corner of the screen, you'll also see that that battery is about to run out any moment now. I can, however, happily report that for this test, the camera did not overheat. On the top left of the ZV E1 is one of Sony's multi interface shoes, complete with the extra pins to support digital audio accessories. And to its right is a three capsule internal microphone, which allows you to switch between patterns. There's an auto mode, which records sound from all around, unless a face is detected, at which point it will concentrate on sound coming from the front of the camera. Alternatively, you can manually select front, all directions, or rear for when you're narrating behind the camera. Like earlier ZV cameras, the E1 is also supplied with a wind muffler that slides onto the hot shoe. Sony supplied my test sample with the version for the white body, but the effect is still the same. So let's hear how those modes compare, starting with the microphone set to front, but initially without the muffler attached, so you're gonna hear some pretty bad wind noise. Don't worry, it won't be for long. So I've come down to the beach on a pretty breezy evening, so I'm going to keep this first clip mercifully short. Right, I've now slid that wind muffler accessory onto the hot shoe, at which point it neatly covers up and hopefully protects the microphone modules. I'm filming this with the 28 to 60 kit zoom at 28 millimeter. I'm about two foot or approximately 60 centimeters away from the camera. And again, it is recording audio using the built-in microphone. Now the ZV E1 actually has several different modes for the microphone and I currently have it set for the pattern to pick up sound from in front of the camera. So it should be concentrating on me and not what's behind or to the sides. And what's actually behind the camera is the C. So I'm gonna try on another setting to see whether you can hear the C a little bit more clearly. Alternatively, why not set the microphone to record sound from all around, in front for me and also behind so you've got some more of the ambient sound of the sea and everything that's going on around me. I'm now positioned behind the camera about one foot away or around 30 centimetres, which is roughly the distance that you might have the camera if you were hand holding it and viewing the screen. I'm using the windshield on the built-in microphone and I have the audio set to rear. So it should be picking up me and not the sound of the sea in front of me. Now I've switched to the microphone facing forward. I'm still speaking from about 30 centimetres or one foot behind the camera. Well, you shouldn't be able to hear me as clearly as before and instead you should be hearing the sound of the sea much more clearly. Now I have the ZV E1 microphone set to all directions, hopefully picking up sound from in front, so the sound of the sea and also the sound of me narrating from behind again from about one foot or 30 centimeters distant from the microphone. Okay, now for the sensor, which as you already know is inherited from the A7S Mark III. This has 12 megapixels, which in turn allows the ZV-E1 to record 4K video without additional cropping, binning, or oversampling. 
it simply slices off the top and bottom in order to achieve the 16 by 9 shape and just starts recording it. Since there's no spare pixels to deal with, the sensor readout can be faster than high resolution models, which should in turn mean reduced skewing from rolling shutter artifacts without incurring the cost of a stacked sensor. To find out, here's the ZV-E1 at 50mm panning back and forth at 1080-25p, well I'd say there really is minimal skewing visible. And now for comparison at 1080-50p, again staying pretty well behaved. Next at 4K 25p, where there's still nothing bad to report, even with pretty severe movements back and forth. Sorry if it's making you feel a bit ill. And finally at 4K 50p, which again looks pretty good to me. This result is in stark contrast to other non-stacked sensors with high resolutions that have to factor in delays from processing more pixels. Again, while the ZV-E1 is designed for video first, it can still take photos if you like, albeit at a maximum resolution of 12 megapixels. Further cementing its intended use for video, Sony's also seen fit to remove the mechanical shutter on the ZV-E1. So unlike the S3, you only have a fully electronic shutter for still photos. While electronic shutters have the benefit of silent operation, they can suffer from artifacts including banding under artificial light and again skewing from rolling shutter. Here's a burst of stills I took at the camera's top speed while quickly panning from side to side. While the skewing isn't as bad as many high resolution models when using their electronic shutters, it is still visible here with the bottle leaning to one side. Since the ZV-E1 has no mechanical shutter to solve this problem, still shooters should be cautious about photographing anything in fast motion. But again, this camera isn't designed for photography. And as I showed you earlier, the rolling shutter artifacts for video is actually much lower than most non-stacked high resolution sensors. In terms of video, the ZV-E1 unsurprisingly inherits most of the quality options of the S3, at least those within the speed of its SD slot. So you can film 1080 from 24 to 240p, or 4K from 24 to 120p, the latter making it one of the most affordable full framers with 4K 120 capabilities. Well, hang on there, not quite yet. As you may have noticed in the menus, there's no mention of 1080 240 or 4K 120 at the time I made this review, as for some unexplained reason, they're not ready for the launch of the ZV-E1. Instead, Sony tells me they'll arrive on a free update in June. So the ZV-E1 will have 1080 240 and 4K 120 capabilities, but not until June 2023. The video quality unsurprisingly matches the A7S Mark III, given the same modes, but again, the speed of the SD slot does prevent the ZV-E1 from offering the highest bitrate options. It also lacks raw output over HDMI, and like all Sony consumer cameras to date, doesn't offer cinema 4K or open gate options, both incidentally available on the Lumix S5 Mark II. That said, you're still getting Sony's latest XAVC HS option for 10-bit 4K, as well as intra options for 1080 and 4K. Eagle-eyed Sony owners will also notice that log shooting has been moved out of the picture profiles and into its own menu. This makes much more sense to me, it's much easier to find now, although it does mean that the picture profile list now has a gap where they previously were. Here's a clip I filmed in S-Log3, and the potential for dynamic range is shared with the A7S Mark III. The ZV-E1 also allows you to import and preview a LUT when filming, or even bake it right into the footage, saving you from an additional step in editing if desired. I believe this is already available on the FX models and will hopefully come to the S3 in a firmware update. A similar capability is also available on the Lumix S5 II. The ZV-E1 also finally includes a dedicated time-lapse mode, which generates a video from images captured at intervals of up to one minute. In this mode, no stills are recorded, so it is for generating video only. Next up, the product showcase mode. Not new to the ZV-E1, it's been seen on several Sony cameras before, but it remains a really useful feature when you're presenting this kind of video, especially now deployed with the benefits of a full frame sensor and its potential for shallow depth of field effects. And speaking of which, I'm using the 28 to 60 millimeter kit zoom at 28 millimeter F4 to give you an idea of what you can achieve at this end of the range. And I'm recording the audio with the built-in microphone, which is concentrating on subjects in front of the camera, such as me. And the way that product showcase mode works is that if you are the only subject on the frame, well, it's going to use face and eye detection to keep you nice and sharp. But as soon as you bring something closer to the camera, in this case, the subject, then this will take priority. This is the thing that the camera will focus on, even if your face is still in the frame. Remove the object, face becomes sharp again, 
bring the object back in again and it will focus on that. Although do be aware of the minimum focusing distance for the lens that you're using. Now, of course, you'll be aware of uh, the rather awkward technique that you had to use prior to modes like these, where face detection was so effective, you would actually have to cover your face with the product rather casually. You'd go, oh, hey guys, I just want to show you this uh, tape measure in front of my face now, because as soon as you'd move it away, it would focus on you, but not with this mode. So this works really well. And it also works with very small subjects, which traditionally presented a bit of a problem um, for this kind of video. If you do ever film any cosmetic videos or watch any of them, again, you'll be very familiar with the presenter trying to casually position whatever it is right in front of their eyes in order to foil the face detection. But there's no need to do that now. You can just hold it to the edge of the frame and you remain present, nice and blurred in the background. So not a new feature, but still a very useful one to have. One of the more frustrating aspects about being a one-person content creator is that when you're stood in front of the camera, well, there's nobody stood behind it to operate it, to adjust things like the lens, focal length, or the camera's position. And what you're left with is generally quite static compositions with you rooted to the ground, too afraid to move left and right too much, lest you actually fall out of the frame entirely. But the ZV E1's new auto framing feature, which I have enabled now, will actually crop in on you and use those spare pixels around the edges to move the frame left and right automatically as you move left and right. And how does it know when to do it? Well, it uses face detection to actually follow your face on the frame and readjust that composition. It's as if the camera is actually being moved left and right. However, I can assure you that the camera is completely static at this point. I'm using the 2860 at 28 millimeter and it very much is static right in front of me. But again, by tracking my face and agreeing for it to be in the middle of the frame, it is giving that impression that there is somebody actually behind the camera operating it. Here's some more examples showing the initial zooming process and the subsequent panning, all of which can be adjusted in the menus. You can even choose to record the cropped version to the SD card and output an uncropped version over HDMI or vice versa if desired. But in a missed opportunity, the auto framing mode won't let you choose a different aspect ratio. So all of the cropped footage is in the traditional wide 16 by nine shape. Imagine how good it would have been to automatically crop a tall nine by 16 shape for vertical video, which could keep you in the frame as you move left and right while simultaneously recording a traditional wider version, even if only in 1080p. This could become even better if auto framing also had access to the full height of the sensor in an open gate mode. I've suggested both of these to Sony, but in the meantime, the ZV E1 does have a bunch of other tricks up its sleeve. Have you ever done one of those walkie talkie pieces to camera where you think you're walking at a constant speed, but you generally slow down when you're trying to make a point and then speed back up again. And it's really hard for the camera operator to actually keep you roughly in the middle of the frame. It's a bit of a disturbing experience. With the ZV E1's new framing stabilizer mode though, which I have enabled now, the camera will automatically crop in a little bit on your face and use the space around that crop to move the composition around. And that's being driven by face recognition. So even if I speed up or slow down a bit, or even if the camera operator is also speeding up or moving unpredictably, I should still be kept in a constant position in the frame. In this case, towards the middle of the frame, but you can position the subject wherever you want. And it doesn't have to be a human subject either. One of the best things about having a reliable face and eye tracking system is that as a one person content creator, you can stand in front of the camera, fairly confident that you're gonna be sharp, even when you've got the background nice and blurry behind you. I'm filming this with the Sony FE 20mm 1.8, which in intelligent auto mode, which I'm using for a very specific reason right now, is currently set to F 2.8. But what happens when a second person enters the frame? Well, normally you'd be stuffed, but the ZV E1, when set to Intelligent Auto, has a very neat trick. It can detect multiple faces and actually adjust the aperture automatically to ensure that everybody is in sharp focus. So it's actually closed now from f2.8 to f11. And then when that person leaves the frame, well, the aperture should automatically open up again, nice and gradually to put you against that nice blurred background again. So the camera has now returned the lens to f2.8 and we're back where we started.
This worked well in the previous example, but it is hampered somewhat by only currently being available in intelligent auto mode, which in turn means having no control over the shutter, the aperture or ISO. Now I deliberately used an f1.8 lens here, but in daylight without an ND, the camera automatically closed it to no larger than f2.8, robbing me of a potentially blurrier background. So I'd really like to see the multiple face option available in the manual modes too. Now for some handheld vlogging starting with the ZV-E1 fitted with the FE 20mm 1.8 prime lens at 1.8 of course, but without any stabilization. So let's fix that straight away by enabling standard steady shot, which here is using sensor shift IBIS alone, allowing you to film without a crop. Next, I've enabled active steady shot, which does incur a crop, but delivers less wobbles. Now, I always thought that active steady shot was applying additional digital compensation, but Sony now tells me that on the full frame alpha cameras, it's actually still only using sensor shift, but in a broader range, which necessitates a crop. The bottom line is the footage is more stable, but it's obviously a bit tighter. New to the ZV-E1 though is dynamic steady shot, which takes active mode and now adds additional digital compensation, which incurs a further crop still, but ironing out more wobbles. That said, with this additional crop, my 20mm is now acting more like a 28, which has arguably become too tight for handheld vlogging, at least when holding the camera with both hands. To illustrate the effect of the various stabilizer crops, here's a static view filmed with the 28-60 kit zoom at 28 with IBIS alone, so this is uncropped. Next, for active steady shot, which again applies a crop to allow the sensor shift system to operate over a broader range. And finally, the new dynamic mode, which applies additional digital compensation for potentially steadier footage, albeit with an even tighter crop. To further illustrate the crop, here's the original clip filmed with IBIS alone for an uncropped result. Now I've superimposed a red frame where the outer edge represents the coverage when you're using active steady shot, which works out at about a 1.12 times field reduction. And finally, the outer edge of the green frame represents what you'll get with dynamic steady shot, which by my calculations works out at about a 1.44 times crop. As always, these crops mean that you'll need very wide lenses if you're a handheld vlogger, especially if you're using both hands, which in turn means the 28-60 kit zoom just isn't gonna cut the mustard. On the left is the 20mm prime at 1.8, and on the right is the 28-60 kit zoom at 28mm f4, both using standard steady shot IBIS without a crop, and already the 28 is arguably too tight. Next, here they are with active steady shot, making the 28 on the right uncomfortably close. And finally, here's both with dynamic steady shot, delivering the least wobbly footage, but with the greatest crop factor. But while the 2860 isn't wide enough for handheld vlogging in front of the camera, it can be great when used with dynamic stabilization when you or someone else is behind the camera instead. But again, if you are handheld vlogging in front of the camera, you will ideally want a 20 or even wider still. Okay, so to wrap up this section on handheld vlogging, I'm filming this with the ZV-E1 and 20mm 1.8 at 1.8, and I am using dynamic image stabilization, but I'm holding the camera one-handed at full arm's length. So it really is wobbling around. This is normally a very unstable holding position for me. So hopefully it looks all right to you. And I'm recording the audio with a built-in microphone. I've configured it to record audio from the front. And since it is a very breezy day, I do have the windshield attached. Before my final verdict, I'm going to showcase the last new mode on the ZV-E1 called Cinematic Vlog. This changes the aspect ratio to a wider 2.35 to 1 shape, changes the frame rate to 24p, and applies softer, moodier tones. You can adjust the style, but here's some clips that I filmed with the default settings. See you in a minute.
The ZV-E1 becomes Sony's most powerful consumer camera aimed at video content creators, delivering the quality and those frame rates of the A7S Mark III in a smaller, more affordable body with the benefits of genuinely improved stabilization, a better quality built-in microphone, and a bunch of cunning modes to make filming easier, especially if you're a team of one. I enjoyed the new modes, especially auto framing, whether the camera was on a tripod or handheld, but for me it is a real missed opportunity not to offer a vertical crop option. Again, imagine being able to record horizontal and vertical versions simultaneously with the camera automatically keeping the subject centered on both. This could be even better still if Sony equipped its cameras with open gate to access the full height of the sensor. Fingers crossed these will come at some point. There's also no getting away from the price of the ZV-E1, which is getting on for three times that of the earlier models in the series. Sure, it's still a cheaper way to enjoy the excellent A7S Mark III sensor with some more vlog-friendly modes, but as a compact ZV camera, you're limited to a single card slot, micro HDMI port, and potentially shorter recording times. Now, these may not be such a big deal in the sub $800 category, but when a camera costs over two grand, you can't help becoming more critical, and these losses could rule it out for some for professional use. Now, there are of course plenty of alternatives at a roughly similar price, albeit aimed more at a hybrid shooter, including Sony's own A7 IV, Canon's EOS R6, and Panasonic's Lumix S5 II. All deliver high resolution photos with the benefits of dual card slots, mechanical shutters, longer recording times and built-in viewfinders, while two of those models also sport full-size HDMI ports with the Lumix additionally boasting open gate facilities. The ZV-E1 counters with 4K at 120p, reduced rolling shutter, a better built-in microphone and those enhanced vlogging modes. As I said at the start, it's unashamedly aimed at videographers and especially one-person content creators. It's certainly capable of great looking results, but ultimately you'll need to weigh up the pros and cons to see if it is exactly the right fit for your personal needs. Oh, and remember if you're handheld vlogging in front of any camera, especially with both hands, remember that you'll ideally need a lens that's wider than 24 mil, especially when applying those enhanced stabilization options, which in turn makes the Sony 28 to 60 kit zoom less than suitable. I'd love to hear what you think in the comments and whether the ZV-E1 is the camera that you've been waiting for. In the absence of a sponsored section in this video, you can also help me out with a like and a follow if you're not already. What do you mean you're not following? And if you're feeling extra generous, I'm always up for a coffee. Or you could always treat yourself to my in-camera photography book. There's links for everything, including the latest ZV-E1 pricing in the description below. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.